This is the Gen Y Leaders Podcast. Welcome to the Gen Y Leaders Podcast, where we guide millennials to become the next generation of business leaders and entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Eric Huey, and multiple times a month, we bring you interviews from high-performing millennials who are challenging perceptions and changing expectations of our generation. Our mission is to help you overcome fear, take action, and go confidently in the direction of your dreams. It's time to start preparing now, mainly because 10,000 baby boomers are retiring every day which will create a vacuum of career opportunities that you've been waiting for. Will you be ready? Niasha, welcome to the Gen Y Leaders Podcast. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, been a long time in the works. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to sit down with us and chat with me and our audience. So if you could just to, to start us off, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is uh, Nyasha and I was uh, born in Zimbabwe. I, I think as a person, I'm passionate about my work and that's because I really love to do um, what I do, which is really to solve problems using uh, technology. And a lot of the passion that I have in what I do is primarily driven with experiences that I've had. And I think this is just uh, who I am as a person. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about your company, Billy, and what you guys do. Absolutely. So Billy is an insurance company that helps people manage their uh, insurance. And by people in this case, I mean construction companies. Okay. And so is it fair to say that you are uh a B2B SaaS or software as a service company? Yes. So we are a B2B software as a service company. Okay. Very cool. And I guess what uh, product or market need, service need did you see to start Billy? Like what were you doing at, at the point of your kind of light bulb idea moment to start Billy? Yeah. So that's a really good question. So my co-founder essentially and I had uh, left a previous company and we were just uh, doing a retrospective on the things that had uh, you know, caused our previous company to fail, which was really uh, enrooted in uh, payments. So we still wanted to stay in payments for construction, but one of the things we consistently heard from uh, you know, people we had spoken to as uh, prospects was that whenever you pay somebody or hire somebody in uh, construction, that typically is a process of uh, exchanging uh, insurance. And that happens to be a very cumbersome process that's done in many different uh, systems. So existing technology doesn't necessarily do the you know, like back and forth between, you know, the person you hire and then their broker uh, and their underwriter as well. So we essentially serve as a platform to help solve that particular problem. Uh, And we started off with that construction because that's the area of domain expertise that we have. Yeah, very cool. I imagine there's a lot of different various types of insurance needs in the construction space as well, as far as like you know, uh, personal liability as far as the labor and the laborist workers goes, and then uh, rental insurance on, you know, big heavy equipment rentals, and then the physical building itself, as far as that being insured from a structural standpoint, am I tracking well there? Absolutely. Uh, So insurance by itself is uh, very complicated for a lot of people. So uh, for people, it's complicated. For businesses, it's also complicated. And to take a further step back, construction isn't just really large buildings going up with cranes. A lot of it actually happens with things that we are familiar with every day, your home, Mm -hmm. Uh, renovations that are happening, uh, remodeling your bathroom or installing a new closet. Those are forms of construction. Mm -hmm. And it employs a lot of really small businesses 
for example, you know, that work for, uh, you know, medium to large size uh, construction companies that maybe build homes or commercial buildings. And a lot of agreements happen and a lot of insurance is exchanged uh, in the process. But, you know, today it's just still happening in like Excel uh, or people still <laughs> use ring binders, you know, mm -hmm. like the ones that you used in college to store paper. Uh, so we're just trying to help facilitate that process between those uh, parties and uh, remove all of this friction that happens today. Very cool. Thanks for the insights there. So besides the practicality of, of your company and, and your mission, and the opportunity you saw with Billy, what is your uh, more personal reasons for, you know, why you do what you do, your why, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the reason, I guess like my why started off because I wanted to live life on my own terms. Mm. And what that meant to me at that time in my previous job was, do you like working for a really large corporation uh, that you've been a part of for a really long time? And the answer was uh, yes, but the way in which I wanted to solve those problems with my passion was just very constricted. Uh, and I couldn't really do it you know, in the way that I thought you know, I could feel passionate and also like uh, blossom as well. So one of the things I learned was uh, other meeting other entrepreneurs that were like myself who had started their own companies solving very specific problems uh, as well. And they were living life on their own terms, meaning they could uh, work the way that they want to. And, and that really attracted me. So I decided to, uh, you know, go find a problem to solve. <laughs> uh, and that really appealed to me, but it was really scary to make that transition of like, okay, like I'm going to actually become an, an entrepreneur and leave the safety of working for a large company um, with a big paycheck and, and uh, go just do this by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I think that more and more and probably throughout the course of the lifespan of the show, that tends to be the number one reason why entrepreneurs go out on their own is that they want freedom. They don't want to have to clock in and clock out a job and, you know, just rely on the paycheck and always be in front of the computer and uh, reliable, you know, not reliable to uh, you know, answerable at any given point within a, you know, eight hour work day or 40 hour work week. So yeah, I appreciate, appreciate you sharing that. Um, tell us, I think you have really interesting background with your aviation experience. So talk a little bit about, you know, the, like what got you started in aviation for one, one part. And then I guess part two, as far as what made you transition from or out of aviation into the technology and uh, software development space. Absolutely. I think uh, my interest in airplanes started off with my father. Yeah. Uh, so I was born in uh, Zimbabwe and my father is not a pilot, but I think he hung around airplanes uh, because I think he, he has a passion for airplanes. I still don't know, but uh, I, I think that was like my first interaction with airplanes going to an airport and, you know, people sit on a terrace and have uh, coffee or tea and just watch airplanes coming in. And that was the thing for me growing up in Zimbabwe. And you would see aircraft coming in from, you know, the UK, like British Airways. So oh, that's uh, awesome. And you'd see people get off. And you'd see, you know, all sorts of uh, planes like Qantas from Australia. And I feel like that's how I learned uh, geography and, yeah. you know, got this knack for uh, aviation. And my dad worked at a uh, bank and his boss was uh, this guy from the UK and his name was Sam. And Sam liked airplanes as well. And he always kept like a magazine for airplanes in his office. So I just uh, started, you know, looking at the pictures and I attribute those magazines to teaching me how to uh, read in English, you know, because yeah. I was just curious, like, oh, like, well, what does this plane uh, do? How much does it, you know, like cost? So I think it was like ingrained in my brain that like I, I wanted to you know like be associated with like uh, aviation uh, at some point but 
I couldn't afford to go for uh, training. So in high school, I joined uh, what's called the Air Cadets at uh, school. So it's not a military uh, program. In this case, it was run by um, you know one of the teachers at school had some kind of like military regiment. Like we were pretending to be uh, you know in the Air Force, you know. Uh, but this guy taught us stuff about uh, airplanes. So I feel like that's where I got the theoretical knowledge and. One day when I uh, had migrated to the US many years uh, later, uh, I got the opportunity to um, you know, go and take what's called a discovery flight. And it's essentially like 30 minutes where you go and uh, hang out in an airplane and you actually go take a little short flight and they let you like fly with the flight instructor. So. When I went up, I was just like, oh my God, like this is uh, amazing, I, I gotta do it. So uh, I found a way to, you know, like pay for it. So I took out a credit card uh, <laughs> loan and, and then I just started uh, learning how to uh, fly airplanes. And it was a thing that I did every weekend for like, uh, you know, six months straight to like uh, get a license. Cause I learned here in New York and the weather is like, you know, on and off. So it takes slightly longer, mm -hmm. but you could, you could do it in a much shorter time. Yeah. And so ever since it just became a pursuit of, you know, I wanted to become a commercial pilot. So you have to go through all this series of training, like you got to get your private pilot, you got to get your instrument rating, you got to get your commercial pilot's license, you got to get 1500 hours. So you have to become a flight instructor. Uh, so yeah. I taught on weekends while being a product manager uh you know on the side I was like a flight instructor and the guy who taught me how to be a flight instructor uh ended up becoming a chief pilot at a uh, jet operator out in uh, Camarillo and so it was like yo like uh, I'm ferrying this plane from Santa Barbara to Camarillo you want to come for a ride and I went and that's when I got the first taste of like flying a jet, you know, because it was like, whoa, like this thing just like straps you to like, a, <laughs> like a rocket. And I was like, yeah, so we're looking for first officers to like work with us and we think you'd be great. And, you know, that was my introduction. And I started doing that on uh, weekends, like uh, just yeah. uh, flying somewhere. Um, and yeah, it, it became a thing. And during COVID, I was like, I should, you know, try this too. So I did that as well while building Billy. It sounds like you did your homework though on our previous discussion. As we discussed, we always, um, one key question or kind of the, the topical question of every episode is if you had to speak to a room full of, you know, a hundred other entrepreneurs, what would you tell them or what lesson would you leave them with? You know, how would you encourage them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what comes to mind from, from that question? Yeah, so I, I thought really long and hard about this, you know, and I thought maybe the best thing I would uh, do is to phrase it in a way of like, what would I tell my younger self, yeah. uh, you know, at that That's point. And I think the, the lesson that I've really learned is, you know, start off with the results, uh, the result that you want in huh. mind. So like the specific thing that you're really, really looking to accomplish. And then, you know, what's, what's the purpose? right? Like, of, like, why am I really like uh, doing this? And sometimes it has to be something very emotional that makes you, you know, want to be like, yeah, like, this is the reason why I want to do this so I can accomplish this. Then once you've figured out that, you can figure out the method of like, all right, like, here's what I need uh, to do. And then forget everything else. It's just like, just focus on that uh, one uh, specific thing that you want to accomplish. So in my time living in Santa Barbara, somebody once taught me, you know, this way of uh, focusing uh, on that. And, you know, he, he was like, if you put a sticky note on your wall right, and yeah. you wake up uh, and just look at that every day or you see it every time you go to bed, I guarantee you that, you know, within that timeline that you focus that specific result like you you probably will accomplish that so I was like all right let me let me do that in the categories of things that I really like to do which was like and I want to go travel 
a lot. I wanted to, you know, uh, get into commercial aviation and find, you know, a uh, jet gig to just like, you know, fly uh, jet aircraft. I also wanted to start a business. Yeah. So, so I put those on a wall and uh, over time, I noticed that I started, you know, traveling. Uh, this is how I met my previous co-founder in uh, the previous company uh, as well. Um, and I got the chance to go and fly commercially. So nice. I think just like that method of starting with your results, your peppers, and then the method um, is the best way to focus because focusing is everything mm -hmm. and you'll be able to accomplish whatever you want. Yeah, great advice. Appreciate that. So besides the sticking out on the wall and just kind of the, the visual reminder for uh, those people who may be more uh, systematic or looking for something more habitual, do you have any processes that you follow as far as like a, a physical journal that you're keeping tasks and goals in and kind of the sub goals like that get you there or um, some type of app or anything that you're working from from there? Yeah, so I struggle with this as well. I guess what is... Uh, you know, what has really worked for me, if I can be brutally honest, is just that same philosophy, yeah. you know, like, uh, what is the specific thing that I'm looking for? Because, you know, like, I, I sometimes try to, like, put things in a journal, mm -hmm. but then it just becomes a list of to do's. And most of those don't really focus me on, you know, exactly where I want to uh, get to, right. So I, I still think that the process of you know, taking time to write out what exactly do I want from, let's say, like the product that I'm building uh, or what I want from Billy this quarter is something that I, you know, take seriously to really think of like, hey, like I, I want to be able to go after general contractors or like, uh, you know, something very specific. Um, and then I just try to figure out like, how do I achieve this specific result? Very cool. Yeah. It sounds like you have more of a internalized approach to where you, you just take on what's important now for the WIN acronym. Yeah. Very similar to, to that as well. Yeah. That's a good approach. Appreciate it. Um, so as we wrap up here, a few key questions, what are some books or resources that you'd recommend to aspiring or current entrepreneurs? Yeah. So um, on that one, I, I like uh, Brene Brown. She has a book called, uh, it's on uh, vulnerability, uh, daring to, um, oh my God, I'm like stalling on the- on Is it the, daring, uh, daring Greatly? Daring Greatly, yes, by yeah. uh, uh, Brene Brown, right? And what I really liked about the book was how she talked about uh, vulnerabilities, not always about you know winning or losing, but sometimes it's about having the courage to show up and be seen when you have no control over the outcome, right? And that being vulnerable sometimes is not, and maybe I'll take the word sometimes, vulnerability is not weakness. It's really our greatest uh, measure of our strength, um, you know, or, or our courage as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, I think like one of my favorite books for new entrepreneurs to really understand that, you know, you're gonna fail many times, but it's, you know, how you have the mental resilience, you know, to keep going and trying new things until you succeed as well. Uh, so that's one book. And then I like uh, the seven habits of highly effective people. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a great book on just uh, discipline and a lot of other like life lessons there. Then I grew up in Africa and there's a, a book called uh, Things Fall Apart. It's uh, written by this Nigerian author. Uh, he died, his name is uh, Chinua Achebe. And it was published like a long time ago, I think in the 60s, but it's kind of seen as the modern African novel in English. And you know, one of the first to receive like uh, uh, global uh, acclaim and it's a staple book that's taught, you know, throughout Africa. And it's really about, you know, the effects of uh, colonialism uh, and it follows the life of this uh, guy um, called uh, Okonkwo. And he's like an Igbo in Nigeria. 
And he's just like a local man who's like a wrestling uh, champion in this fictional like Nigerian clan. Uh, so the story just kind of like follows him, the interaction with like Christian missionaries and how they came you know, into African communities as well. So I feel like that's like one book I would recommend for people who just want to read something that's totally different than the culture that we're in right now. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, well, I haven't heard of that one. So I'll be sure to look that one up and I'll link to those that you mentioned there in, in our show notes for anyone listening or watching so uh, they can look them up as well. Uh, where can people best connect with you, follow you, uh, support you, et cetera? Yeah, so I guess like you can catch me on uh, LinkedIn or uh, Twitter uh, as well. Awesome. And yeah, we'll be sure to link to all your personal information. So uh, especially LinkedIn, I know you're active there. Uh, so people can follow your success of your career. Thank you so much for having me. That wraps up today's episode. We hope to have brought you some valuable key takeaways. Most importantly, whatever you learned, take action on it. Apply it to your life. Apply it to your career. Motivation and inspiration only come as a result of taking that first step. So if you're enjoying the podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe on whichever platform you found the show. You can also follow us on all the major social media platforms or contact us directly at genyleaders at gmail.com. That's G-E-N-W-H-Y leaders at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Eric Huey, and thanks for listening to the Gen Y Leaders Podcast.